I'm David Canzeri from the Piedmont Heart Institute in Atlanta, Georgia. And welcome to, uh, I think, what will be a very engaging session entitled A Key Space Approach to Finding the Balance Between Bleeding and Ischemic Risks. I'd like to introduce as part of this program our, our my colleagues and friends and faculty, uh, beginning with Dr. Uh, Osfar, beginning with with um, Dr. Uh, Osfar Zaman from Newcastle upon Tyne in the United Kingdom. We also have uh, Beatrice uh, Bacarizo from Spain, Dr. Manos Brilakis from the United States and Frankie Tam from Hong Kong. In addition to that, uh, we have a chat master, Dr. Mirvat Alasnog from Saudi Arabia. And we encourage uh, you all to please submit questions and comments uh, online as well that we'll be able to address. As an introduction to this program, uh, high, patients undergoing PCI who represent a high bleeding risk for complications uh, represent up to 40% of the total PCI population. And given that the mortality risk for these patients is at least similar after a bleeding event as an ischemic event raises further attention to considerations around the balance of dual antiplatelet therapy, particularly when complex PCI is performed. Generally, these patients have been excluded from clinical trials, or historically, they've been treated with bare metal stents. And current guidelines from both the United States and in Europe, while they endorse uh, abbreviated dual antiplatelet therapy durations for selected patients with high bleeding risk characteristics, uh, until recently, there has been very little data, and much of this has been a consensus opinion to support such recommendations. That said, historical uh, observational experience with the zotorolimus eluding resolute stent um, supported favorable safety and efficacy outcomes among patients when dual antiplatelet therapy was abbreviated as, as short as a one month period. And this led then to the recent completion of both the Onyx One global randomized clinical trial, as well as in the United States and in Japan, the Onyx One clear study both studies uh, demonstrating either non-inferiority to the drug-coded um, uh, biofreedom stent in the Onyx One Global Randomized Trial, but also uh, meeting a performance goal in the Onyx One Clear study, favorable safety events of cardiac death MI and stent thrombosis when dual antiplatelet therapy was abbreviated to durations as short as one month after treatment with the Resolute drug eluting stent. And indeed, at the American College of Cardiology meeting just this past week, the two-year outcomes with the, um, with the Onyx One randomized trial were presented, again, showing favorable safety and efficacy over long-term follow-up in these high bleeding risk patients who are again treated with just one month of dual antiplatelet therapy and then transitioning to a single antiplatelet agent. So with that background, um, I know that that the dilemma for us in clinical practice is thinking about dual antiplatelet therapy duration in high bleeding risk patients, but also patients with a great deal of ischemic risk. And we have three, three expert clinicians to present a case-based dilemmas for us and introduce, a, uh, I think, an open discussion amongst the group. And again, we welcome you to, uh, to join in on our, on our conversations with these, with these presentations and with this distinguished panel. So, Masfar, I'll, I'll ask you perhaps as our discussant to introduce our first case presenter, and uh, we'll go from there. Yeah, thank you, David. Thank you for the introduction. So the, the purpose of the next series of, of cases that you will see is to highlight a, the, um, the real world nature of uh, the Resolute Onyx One trial, where there was no vessel or lesion limitations. There were real world patients and they had the broadest high bleeding risk inclusion criteria of previously conducted uh, studies. So it's a real pleasure to introduce Beatrice Vaccarizo from uh, Spain, and her presentation is going to highlight the role of this stent in high bleeding uh, risk patients with bifurcation lesions. Beatrice. Uh, Thank you. I think it's a, it's a recorded presentation. I'm going to present a case of complex by 4K PCI in high risk patient. This is my potential conflict of interest. The patient in question was a 77 years old male with a chronic kidney disease with a severe renal failure. The patient had hypertension and dyslipidemia, and that patient has a previous a lower intestinal tract bleeding due to angiodysplasia of the colon. Uh, 
This patient in 2018 has an angina and we did, uh, we performed a coronary angiography and we observed a severe and mid and distal right coronary stenosis that was treated with two drug eluting stents. So the patient was admitted because of current effort angina and in the myocardial perfusion we observed an anterior lateral ischemia with a good ventricular ejection fraction. So this patient is a high re bleeding risk patient because it's an old patient with a severe renal failure and also that patient has a previous uh, bleeding event. Here you can see the coronary angiography. You can see on the left that there is a mid LED stenosis, is a moderate angiographic lesion. And also you can see that there is a big diagonal branch with a significant lesion. There, there is a long lesion, is 111 bifurcate lesion. On the left, you can see that the first diagonal marginal branch has a moderate lesion in the proximal part, is a 40%. And also you can see the right coronary uh, artery that there is diffuse disease with the patent drug loading stent in the distal part. So we have a patient with a anterior lateral ischemia with an angiographic moderate lesion in the mid LED. So we wanted to check that if that lesion was uh, significant or not to plan the strategy. So we did FFR to the diagonal branch and mid LED and also to the right coronary artery and was really positive on the first diagonal and LED and was negative to the right coronary artery. So also we did IVUS and the goal of the IVUS was to analyze the proximal and distal diameters and also the plaque characteristics. So you can see here from distal to proximal the mid LED and diameters were around 3, 3.3 and also there is no calcification, only a little bit in the proximal LED. We did the same for the diagonal branch and is a really big diagonal branch with around 3 millimeters diameter branch with a long lesion and there is no calcification. So we have a high risk bleeding patient. Yes, we have an old patient with a severe renal failure and also has a pre-bleeding event. And there is a true bifurcate lesion because it's conferred by FFR, the significance of the LAD. And this is a complex bifurcate lesion. I think so, because uh, if we follow the studies, there is a big side branch with a long lesion in this side branch, in the first diagonal branch, and by the studies, this is a complex bifurcate lesion. And when we decide the two stent technique, there are some different techniques, but we have some evidence favorable to the decay crash. So we perform a double kissing crash to the LED to first diagonal branch. You can see here, we position the onyx stand 3.22 in the diagonal branch and we placed a non-compliant balloon on LED. After stand implantation in the first diagonal branch, you can see here a post dilatation with a non-compliant balloon, the osteal part of the stand. We follow and we did the first crash with the no compliant balloon in the LED crashing the proximal part of the stand of the first diagonal branch. After that, we recross, we rewind the first diagonal branch and we did the first kissing balloon LED first diagonal branch. So we follow and we implant the second stand in the mid LED, crushing the first diagonal branch with an onyx 326. And then we did pot with a no compliant balloon 3.5. Then we again recross the wires and we did the second kissing balloon inflation with two no compliance balloon 3.0 and 220. So this is the final result that is quite good, but in that patient with a high risk bleeding, I think it's important to do IVUS to check everything. And what, what is the goal of this IVUS is to avoid the stand under expansion and malaposition because in that patient that we 
need to do as less as possible the dual antiplatelet therapy, that is really important. So you can see here proximal to distal the LAD, LAD first diagonal and proximal LAD that the stent is well opposed. And from the diagonal, we did the same, diagonal distally, the bifurcation and proximal, and you can see the crushed part of the drug looting stand, but everything is correct. So in conclusion, I think in, in high-risk bleeding patients for bifurcate lesion, if possible, keep it simple. Provisional t stand would be the ideal strategy because less stands will be better for endotalization. However, when two stent technique is needed, I think it's important to optimize the stent implantation. We need zero or minimal malaposition, so it really recommended both, and I think it's mandatory to do final key symbol. I think maybe there is some controversial, but the stent design is really important, and I think intravascular imaging stenting is relevant in this case, in every, in every case, but in this case is more important because also, we need to use drug looting stand with evidence that the possibility to stop dual antiplatelet therapy uh, the less time possible, a month or three months. Thank you. Thank you, Beatrice. Uh, uh, excellent case. Can I just ask you at this point, Is do you use the ARC-HBR trade-off model at all in the cases that you do? And this seemed to be a pretty ideal uh, case uh, for that. Sorry, I even understand the question. Sorry, you know, there is a, a, an app for the ARC ARC uh, high bleeding risk trade off model where you can put uh, uh, data into the app. So, patient level data such as current smoker, hemoglobin, EGFR, complex PCI, age, and, and that will give you a, a, a breakdown of the bleeding and thrombosis risk. No, I usually don't don't use the, this application. But uh, for in general, uh, when the patient is more than seventy five years old and has another risk uh, of bleeding, to me is a, a really is the indications of only one trial is the, is a high risk bleeding, and depending on the the length of the stent, the diameter of the stent, and if you overlap the stent, the risk of thrombosis is quite high. But I think. We need more and more to use these applications because it's more objective than my personal vision of the patient. Yes. One of the things I do want to highlight is, is, is in try and link the case that you've shown to the Resolutonics, which was a real world uh, uh, study using complex uh, patients, high level, 80% of B2C lesions. But the important thing is, is that patients, 46% of patients had two or more high bleeding risk criteria. And I think this is really important. Manos, if I may come to you, how important do you think the Resolute Onyx trial is to everyday practice, particularly in terms of the patient inclusion criteria uh, for the trial? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and again, a great presentation uh, for the um, bifurcation case. I do think the nice thing about uh, the um, the study was that it was fairly broad, inclusive criteria. It had very large uh, amount of large uh, type of complex lesions, including bifurcations and CTOs. And I think by having that uh, broad population, that makes it more applicable to everyday practice. Now, having said that, like every trial, there is probably some limitation. Some people may not have wanted to have maybe the most complex bifurcations or the most complex CTOs. But I do think that for the most part, it was a, a large, uh, 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 very broad criteria study. Yeah. That's yeah. far, I was um, going to also ask us, uh, ask our EuroPCR colleagues that we have a polling question too, if they can bring that up as well. And if not, we'll, we can continue on in our discussion. Um, I'll let them see if they can bring it up. But regardless, Beatrice, I, I think also it was a terrific example of, of a, an imaging-based uh, complex intervention. And just as um, Asfar had brought up that um, you remind us that high bleeding risk criteria rarely occur in isolation alone. Um, that is, they're more commonly paired with uh, age and a need for an oral anticoagulation or 
Alternatively, um, there's some other bleeding risk factors that um, challenge the, the considerations of dual antiplatelet therapy. And the point of Onyx-1 randomized trial and the, and the Onyx-1 clear studies were not that every patient should receive only one month of DAPT, but if it, if it is required to be as abbreviated as one month, that it's a, it's a, safe, and it's a safe strategy. I think this is, this is the idea uh, because in that complex patient that we have uh, two stents and there is some crash uh, part of the stent, I think maybe one month is too strict and maybe three months could be better for that woman. Uh, but if the, if the patient uh, has a bleed event, you can stop early. And to me, this trial gives me the, the secondary point of view that is a really good stent. And now we have some evidence that if it's needed, we can stop the dual antiplatelet therapy earlier. But if not is needed, maybe we can prolong a little bit uh, because in that case, there is two stents and the evidence in that trial, there is a small numbers for complex. It's true that there was open all type of lesions, but when you go to the numbers, there is, I think, 10%, 15% of true bifurcation lesion with two stent technique. So it's interesting, too, that in our poll so far, um, the question is, when using a two-stent bifurcation strategy, what is the ideal DAPT time for this high bleeding risk patient? We have 17% seven, of our respondents suggested one month. And then alternatively, the majority of 55% of suggest a three-month period, 24% six month and 5% 12 months. So it's interesting, the majority of people recommend at least six months or less um, with, the major with, the, with the clear majority favoring a three month duration. And, and I think David, just to touch on your point, and I think it's worth emphasizing that the Onyx-1 trial doesn't mandate one month therapy. What it does, it gives the physician confidence that if they have to reduce the DAPT after four weeks, it gives the physician and patient confidence that it is safe to do so. Yeah. I think one other point here is, as you mentioned, that, that it's not just the type of lesion, but also how well the lesion was treated. So when you have such high quality images with OCT and you see beautiful stand expansion in a position, I think everyone feels much more comfortable to give a, a shorter duration if needed, as you just mentioned. But yeah. let's say there was no imaging done and you're not confident that you have expanded the stents well, I think people might be much more hesitant to give this uh, short duration of uh, DAPT. I agree, and particularly where you have stent overlaps and you have two, three layers of stents that you will have in, in a DK uh, culotte situation, it may be that you feel more comfortable prolonging the dual antiplatelet therapy, and I think that makes sense. It's interesting that when we pulled the data from the randomized trial and from the US and Japan Onyx-1 CLEAR study, and we looked at complex PCI as we presented at TCT last year, the unadjusted event rates are expectedly higher for adverse events for complex PCI, whether it's a total occlusion, a saphenous vein graft, as in Beatrice's case, a two-stent bifurcation. But in, a, in, adjustment, in an adjusted analysis, still the outcomes are similar to that with a one month duration of associated with non-complex PCI. And it's really interesting that the, the drivers in multivariable analysis were other factors, more, more clinically based factors driving the higher risk of adverse outcomes in the complex PCI cohort rather than complex PCI itself, rather than complex anatomy. It's often that these patients, because of their disease burden, have other coexisting conditions that pose a higher risk for future myocardial infarction or mortality or 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 tar even repeat revascularization as well yes absolutely and i think you know i alluded to the rphbr trade-off model and and it's quite clear that there are certain patient level features that are common to both high bleeding and high ischemic risk and this is of course the reason why it, it poses a problem in balancing the ischemic and bleeding risk because often Things like current smoking, low hemoglobin, low EGFR, and complex PCI are common to both. And as far just before we leave, um, a great presentation from Beatrice too. I'll ask uh, Beatrice as well a question from our from our audience. And the question is: Considering a patient with high bleeding risk, should we consider a provisional approach?
and reserve a two cent strategy only if there's compromise? I think I know your answer would be keep it simple regardless of the bleeding risk, but tell us, tell us your thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I think after the ABC main study that just has been presented at PCR, uh, despite this for left main, we have more evidence now that keep it simple is more and more important. But to me, in really complex bifurcate lesion is the reason I did FFR to confirm that the LAD was uh, positive because if not, maybe I changed my, my strategy. But with two big bezels, um, provisional T10 is one option, and maybe if the result is not really good, follow guided by FFR in the diagonal branch, maybe you can finish with culotte. Maybe it was a safer strategy for that patient to start with provisional T10 only if needed, finish with a culotte strategy. Because the mortality rate of bleeding, cardiologists, we don't follow, we don't take too much in account, and we take more in account the uh, ischemic events, and more and more we need to change uh, mentality to see more this risk of bleeding because it's really correlated with mortality. Great comments from everyone. And Asfar, um, do you want to transition us to our next yeah, presentation? Thank you. So, so thank you. it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Manos Brilakis from his mobile office, no less, displaying his mobile office. And <laughs> what Manos will uh, tell us about, I hope, is um, a, a, a case of chronic total occlusion and atrial fibrillation. Manos, the floor is yours. Hi, this is Manos Brilakis, and it is my pleasure to present a case on a, a patient who has atrial fibrillation as well as CTO. This was a patient, uh, these are my disclosures, and these are the, dis the description of the patient who was a 66-year-old gentleman with previous coronary bypass graft surgery. He had a severe angina and uh, presented with uh, atrial fibrillation and was started on warfarin several months prior to the procedure. Multiple comorbidities, including diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, as well as obesity with a BMI of 40.5. He was sent for a third PCI attempt of the right coronary artery CTO because of uh, refractory angina. Importantly, he is high bleeding risk because of concomitant kidney disease, as well as oral anticoagulation. This is a diagnostic angiogram from the previous attempt. It is a heavily calcified long occlusion of the right coronary artery with a distal vessel filling from contralateral collaterals. The plan here, given the complexity of the lesion and the previous failed attempts, was to try to use a retrograde first approach. Again, this is a patient with previous coronary bypass graft surgery. In, in general, we don't do two cabbage for those patients, but we'll go straight to PCI, especially if it is single vessel disease, as in this patient. We used uh, a retrograde approach through a septal collateral. Retrograde crossing was easy using a SUO or three guide wire that uh, successfully crossed into the distal um, true lumen. However, unfortunately, in, despite the wire going through this tortuous course, we were then unable to uh, be able to get through with the microcatheter. And that is why we had to rewire using a different septal collateral with a filter XTR. And this time we were able to actually deliver a Caravel microcatheter all the way to the distal cap. We did perform a tip injection to visualize the vested distally. To our dismay, the patient had a bifurcation on the distal cap, again, very long occlusion and heavily calcified. We came under grade trying to knuckle a Mongo guide wire. And that was challenging, but eventually moved to the mid RCA. We couldn't get any further. That is why we used another Mongo retrograde, knuckling it up into the course of the right coronary artery. Then use it as a marker to advance our undergrade guide wire. But then we couldn't advance a balloon. And that is why we used a small 1.0 by 15 millimeter sapphire to actually make some entry and get through. The right coronary artery was undilatable. Proximally, that is why we used multiple high pressure balloon inflations. And after doing that, we were able to deliver an undergrade guide extension and did a guide extension reverse card, which successfully led to crossing and externalization of an R350 guide wire. Once again, we did have a significant under expansion approximately in the right coronary artery, but we were able to cross. Now we have a undergrade flow into the right coronary artery with extensive plane of dissection in the distal RCA. Fortunately, with very high pressure inflation, up to 20 atmospheres, 
who were actually able to expand the proximal right coronary artery. And then we did uh, um, decide about how to deal with the bifurcation because there were actually two branches coming off close to the distal cap. So to do that, we advanced a dual lumen Sasuki microcatheter that we used to advance guide wires into those branches. It was challenging to wire through, but again, after multiple attempts, we were able to successfully wire into the um, right uh, posterior lateral vessel, which was actually appeared to be even larger than the posterior descending artery. Now, the challenge here was that the flow undergrade was very limited to the PDA. So we had another lesion in the PDA immediately distal to the touchdown point of the septal collateral utilized for the retrograde approach. So once again, we used the dual lumen microcatheter to advance an undergrade guide wire. It essentially converted our retrograde system to an undergrade system. But the challenges didn't stop. Now we could not expand the distal lesion in the PDA. Despite multiple high pressure balloon inflations, up to 30 atmospheres, there is a clear waste on the balloon. To overcome this, we ended up using orbital atherectomy, delivered all the way to the PDA. And after doing that, we were able to successfully expand the lesion. Now we are ready to start uh, stenting. We do have wires in the posterior lateral as well as the posterior descending artery. And then we were able to stand using a 275 by 38 millimeter resolute stand all the way from the PDA to the distal RCA using the provisional approach that um, expanded uh, very well. But then we did have a little pinching of the ostium of the right posterior lateral vessel. And to overcome this, once again, we used the dual lumen microcatheter, the Sasuki to advance uh, a guide wire to the posterior lateral. And then the Kisik balloon inflations with 2.5 millimeter balloon in the posterior lateral and 275 millimeter balloon in the PDA. That provided a nice result. There was good flow in the right posterior lateral. And then we placed additional stents. We did have stents all the way from the distal RCA, all the way to the ostium of the vessel, as it is commonly done for extensively diseased right coronary CTOs uh, as this patient had. So after multiple post dilatations, we did have a nice result. Timothy flow in the PDA, Timothy flow into the right posterior lateral vessel. And we did have to overcome several limitations, several, several problems in this case, including an issue with the guide. Actually, usually we put the eight friends guide in the CTO vessel, but here due to miscommunication, we had the seven friends, which actually uh, did lead to some difficulties with trapping with the dual lumen and uh, wire position loss on a couple of times during the case. We had difficulty crossing the collateral with the microcatheter, having to use another microcatheter, difficulty penetrating the distal cap, difficulty crossing the proximal cap requiring a small balloon, difficulty dilating the proximal cap that was overcome with high pressure inflations, bifurcation distal cap that was treated with a dual loom microcatheter and using the provisional approach, undilatable lesion in the PDA that required orbital atherectomy, compromise of the side branch requiring Kissy balloon post dilatation undilatable proximal right coronary artery requiring high pressure inflations, and finally challenges with antiplatelet treatment. And the patient did have a complete relief of his angina and was able to increase his activities. Our antiplatelet therapy for this patient was to continue the warfarin and then convert uh, uh, to clopidogrel for 12 months without aspirin. We did not do a week or a month of aspirin, although this is commonly done, and that is a point that can be discussed later on during the session. However, uh, the patient so far has been doing well without any evidence of bleeding. We do know from uh, the result on its trial that actually most patients who have atrial fibrillation are a and undergo PCI are able to convert to a single antiplatelet therapy together with anticoagulation one month after the percutaneous coronary intervention. Uh, quite often in our practice, we actually also give aspirin uh, only for a week or even less than that, depending on the patient's risk. The patients overall do very well. This is another slide that, as David showed in the beginning of the session, demonstrating that those patients, although overall they have good outcomes in terms of target lesion failure, they still remain a high risk of bleeding complications, hence optimizing their anticoagulation treatment is very important. Thank you so much. Thank you, Manus. Uh, that was a real tour de force. I mean, you CTO guys speak a different language. Mongo, Suo, Sasuke. Unbelievable. <laughs> Great case.
Um, what I want to ask you is, how did you manage the uh, oral anticoagulation pre-procedure? You've said clearly post-procedure. How did you manage uh, the pre-procedure anticoagulation? Yes, so for every especially complex uh, procedure like this one, we always stop the warfarin five days before the procedure. We want to have an INR as close to one as possible, but definitely less than one, less than 1.5. And then we resume it essentially the day of the procedure uh, and give aspirin until uh, the patient's INR is therapeutic. Now, I understand that it's ideal to actually get a, a dog, not a warfarin. Warfarin is probably not the best choice in, in those patients. But unfortunately, the cost is very high in the U.S. And that's why many patients, even though they would want to have a direct uh, anticoagulant, unfortunately, they are still taking uh, warfarin. Okay, well, that, that's an important difference because the recommendation here is that we switch if any patients come in on warfarin because the clinical data is fewer bleeding with a direct oral anticoagulant. That would be the uh, certainly the, our, 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 our practice here. Can I just ask you about heparin then on the day in patients on warfarin? Yes, actually, we do not change our heparin regimen. We still give 100 units per kilo at the beginning of the case. We check an ACT about five minutes after we give the 100 units per kilo, and then we supplement. In cases like this one, when it's a retrograde case, um, I personally want to have an ACT of uh, 350 seconds or more, if I can. And then again, every 30 minutes, we check it to ensure that it remains uh, uh, 350 seconds or more. Uh, as far as, <clears throat> if I may interrupt too, I'll ask our EuroPCR colleagues to just bring up our polling question while we continue this discussion. Um, but uh, Manus, um, like Asfar shared, it's a terrific presentation. I think you 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 took your full afternoon for that case. Uh, it was a, a real endeavor. And and um, and you know, just as you mentioned too, uh, that most patients may be preferred for a direct oral anticoagulant. Um, in patients who are treated with warfarin, and you've recently undergone PCI and you're resuming warfarin, you know, theoretically with warfarin, we, th we always have thought about this um, short-lived uh, hypercoagulable state of resuming warfarin anticoagulation without a, an antithrombin like heparin on board. After the PCI setting and uh, a complex PCI, nevertheless, like this, is that ever a, of a clinical concern for you or do you just restart the warfarin without a bridge of, uh, of a low molecular or unfractionated heparin? Yeah, thanks, David. I think that's an outstanding point. And uh, there's, the brief answer is that uh, for most patients, we do not. The ones that I personally are very uh, concerned and, and give a short duration of uh, low molecular weight heparin are the ones with a previous thromboembolic event, like a previous stroke. For those, I think the risk is significant and uh, I, I do a little bridge. But for the other patients in general, we do not give a bridge of low molecular weight heparin. And, and certainly, David, if I can add to that, certainly in the yeah. era preceding the P2Y12 inhibitors, that concern of hypercoagulability uh, on restarting warfarin was very prevalent. And we used to keep patients in, you know, for three or four days when the only option was warfarin and aspirin. I think DAPT has reduced that concern. And of course, one of the advantages of switching to a, a direct oral anticoagulant is that you don't, don't then need to keep patients in hospital until the INR is, is, is up to scratch. Let me, uh, let me ask you too, as far, and, and perhaps we can extend this to either Beatrice or, or Frankie too, but um, it's interesting when we, when, we, um, when we ask our audience what their antithrombotic regimen afterward would be, um, there's a large response for clopidogrel for 12 months and then a direct oral anticoagulant, um, something to which you're suggesting as far and, 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 um, and, and something I think that Manus would, um, would generally support too. It's interesting though that, um, that uh, for, for, for the triple antithrombotic therapy though, we interestingly, we see um, for triple antithrombotic therapy for one month, 14% of our respondents said they would do this for one month and then follow thereafter, I think, with a single antiplatelet agent and, and warfarin. And it's interesting in the Onyx experience, in the Onyx uh, randomized trial and the Onyx clear study, about 5 to 10% of patients like Manus's case were treated with a single antiplatelet agent from the outset of the procedure along with the oral anticoagulant. 
Um, the remainder received triple antithrombotic therapy for one month and then transitioned to a single antiplatelet agent. Whether I'm old fashioned or not, I probably still do the, uh, I'm, maybe I'm with the minority, but I'm still doing um, for complex cases like this, uh, one month of both aspirin and clopidogrel combined with the oral anticoagulant and then transitioning to clopidogrel and, um, and the anticoagulant. Um, Beatrice or, or Frankie, any thoughts from your end? Yeah, it's maybe controversial, but uh, in my practice, in, in high risk bleeding patients, really high, and when I have to do uh, cases like this, sometimes I close the left appendage uh, with a device and then left out the anticoagulation. So I prefer to do dual antiplatelet therapy maybe six months and left anticoagulation and close the left appendage. I think for menos case, I think for those people who do CTO or uh, intervention, we know that it's a very, 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 very tough case. I mean, uh, bifurcation, CTO, long stand, also very diffuse multiple lesions in the distal vessel pad. So we all think that this guy really is more, I would say, uh, antiphobotic. So probably in this case, I will stick to maybe one month or at least two weeks triple, and then a warfarin with a copper to group. Just, uh, it's not just from the data, just, just, just our eyes, I mean, on the anatomy. I think Mendel's case is, is terrific, very complex. You can see all the calcium there. So probably for those who do uh, uh, cases like this, we are more inclined to uh, more uh, prolonged antibiotics in this case. I mean, what I would add to that is, is, is that in, 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 in Manus's case, what's driving the longer duration of DAPT, of course, is the length of stents. You know, it, it is a full metal jacket. So that is driving you to have a longer duration of DAPT. One of the things that I think is really important is that when you deal with patients like this as high bleeding risk is that the physician has to have a real feel for that patient and their bleeding risk. I know I've touched on the ARC-HBR trade-off models and there are other models, but I think we as physicians have to have a real feel for whether that bleeding risk is high or, or, or intermediate or low. And then you adjust the 12-month DAPT, which is what I would have wanted for the length of stent that I would have in a low bleeding risk patients, and then adjust that accordingly. And I come back again to David's point at the beginning. What Onyx uh, uh, One trial gives you is the confidence is that if you have to stop at one month, you can, but in that case, you have the uh, ability to keep it going for three or six months or longer. As far as any, um, I, 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 our, our audience didn't find much of a role for Prasagrel or Ticagrel or combined with the oral anticoagulant, which I think yeah. um, would be favored. Any role for those agents combined with the oral anticoagulant? I, I, I think that if I look at the data, the very, very uh, a single digit percentage patients were on Ticagrel or that I'm aware of in oral anticoagulants, but none with Prasagrel. So my personal feeling is absolutely not. Once you have an oral anticoagulant on board, then I'm going to say that the P2Y12 agent of choice is clopidogrel. Okay. As far, perhaps you could take us to our third, uh, our third case then. Manus, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Manus. Thank you, um, thank you David. So our third and final case is uh, from Frankie Tan. And once again, to fit in with the uh, uh, clinical trial data, we're now going to, we, we, we've talked about bifurcations, we've talked about CTO atrial fibrillation, and now we're going to see a case of ST elevation myocardial infarction. Frankie, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. So my name is Frankie Tam from Creamery Hospital, Hong Kong. Thanks for having, he, uh, having me here to share this topic of acute STEMI and HBR. So I have no conflict of interest. Okay, so now I would like to present a case for discussion. So this is a 78-year-old lady with good premorbid she walks unaided. She has history of hypertension and old ischemic stroke. As such, she was on aspirin monotherapy. This time, she presented with central chest pain for two hours. The ECG showed ST elevation over inferior leads. So the diagnosis is acute inferior STEMI. And obviously, the solution is to proceed to PPCI. So just as other speakers has mentioned, Nowadays, the assessment of bleeding risk of patients is very, is very important. 
up to 40% of PCI patients are actually at high bleeding risk. So we can see all these HPL criteria. And in this patient, it seems that she had two HPL criteria, two HPL minor criteria. But the fact is, is that true? This is just the first patient encounter I have for her. And this is an acute stemic situation for PPCI that I do not have enough time to explore very deeply about her history and also any physical, physical abnormalities. Anyway, we proceed to coronary angiogram. This is the angiogram of the left side. You can see just minor disease of the left main LAD and circumflex artery. This is the angiogram of the right side, and you can see there's a very tight stenosis in this two hour CA, which can actually account for her presentation of acute inferior SD elevation MI. So when we talk about acute STEMI and PPCI, when they meet HBL, it's actually a nightmare for clinicians. Firstly, although potent antifrombotics is initially decided, subsequent bleeding is shown to have increased mortality and morbidity. And sometimes if the patient have bleeding, they have to stop the antipodal agents. And sometimes patients may develop conditions that may need temporary discontinuation of, it, of antipodal agents. And as I've mentioned, HPL is common in clinical practice. Even in situation of acute STEMI, we still have patients with HPL. This is a study, a small registry in my center, which actually showed that one third of patients presented with acute STEMI PPCI has at least one HPL criteria. So STEMI, PPCI, and HPL is actually not uncommon. So in this case, we want to have PPCI to the RCA. But how can we optimize the outcome in PPCF HPR patients? First, we should avoid unnecessary stenting. For example, we should avoid putting very small stent in distal vessels. And by such, we also want to optimize our PCF in intravascular imaging. And also, we have to use stent with evidence in HPR uh, status. So in this case, we perform IFAS in this patient. You can see for IFAS, we can identify the landing of the stent. And so we put in a vessel onyx 315 uh, and we post that with an NC315. This is the final results. You can see timber free flow with very good angiographic outcome. So is it the end of the, uh, of the case? No. So the patient is actually stable after the PPCI, the chest pain and ECG changes subsided. When the first set of blood results come back after the PPCI, it shows that the patient has mild anemia and also mild uh, 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 kidney dysfunction with EGFR of 145. So now the patient just, uh, do not have only two minor HPL criteria. Now she has one major and three minor HPL criteria. And such, what will be your DAPT regime? Will you stick to one year of DAPT or just six months as regarded uh, uh, by the guidelines? So let's see what this patient goes. So at day five after the uh, PBCI, the patient was on uh, DAPT, has been a computer group. However, however, she developed on and off per rectal bleeding. What is the diagnosis? So actually this patient is having a colon cancer in colonoscopy. Subsequent investigation, the PET CD showed that the disease is localized and surgical resection was recommended by the surgeon. So now this patient has two additional HPL criteria that is active cancer and also planned surgery on DAPT. So this patient now has three major plus three minor HPL criteria. So what can we do and what should we do? So in this case, after careful discussion with patient and family, the surgeon, anesthetist, and oncologist, we withhold the uh, computer bill one month after the PBCI, and then surgical resection was successfully performed. The, that is a creative resection, the patient was stable, and there was no ischemic event, and the patient was remained on single antipathy agent, that is aspirin monotherapy afterwards. So ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, HPL is not uncommon, even in stem B PPCI setting. Assessment of HPL status sometimes can be difficult in the emergency situation like stem B PPCI. So using a stance with HPL indications allow flexibility in adjusting elevated regime post PPCI. Thank you very much.
Yeah, thank you, Frankie. That's uh, a, a, a tremendous case. And what this highlights to me are two aspects. Increasingly now, we are performing PCI in elderly patients, and, and, and this case is, is great, and they have additional comorbidities, as you've beautifully shown. The second thing that this case highlights is the unknown nature of patients who come in as an emergency with ST elevation myocardial infarction. So I want to put it uh, uh, to you first, then Beatrice and Manos. In such patients who come in with ST elevation myocardial infarction, regardless of age, should we only be using stents that have proven one month safety? And then you have the ability to adjust later. Yeah, exactly. I think I think that's a very, very uh, practical question. So uh, I think, of course, uh, if uh, 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 if possible, it, it's good to, for, for us to print a stamp with month-long DABT indication or evidence, especially in uh, elderly patients. From my experience or uh, uh, registry in, in, uh, in my centre, uh, one third of them have HPR criteria, and actually one fifth of them uh, has some indication of uh, withholding or interruption of the APD, particularly in elderly patients, for example, in patient older than 65 or, uh, or 70 years old. So my practice nowadays, I probably use a stand with a uh, one-month DAPD, not, uh, not, not necessitating to stop the DAPD in one month, but just allow the flexibility to withhold one of them. Yeah, and I think flexibility is the word. Beatrice, so uh, STEMI patients where the history may not be comprehensively known, what is your policy? Um, I think it's recommended uh, the stands with evidence, but in the real practice, uh, my colleagues feel maybe because of the pressure of the companies that all the last generation of drug eluting stand maybe are similar to the Onyx. So they use any last generation of drug eluting stand. It's true that the only, for the moment, the only one has evidence is Onyx, but um, in, in the daily practice, uh, in a STEMI patient, high-risk bleeding, we use one of the last, Synergy, Science. So it's true that sometimes we need to follow more the evidence, but uh, it's a reality in my, in my center in Barcelona. Yeah. Manos, is flexibility important for you with this patient population, STEMI and elderly? Yes, and, and I agree with uh, everything that has been said before, and I agree also with what uh, Beatrice just said, that yes, it's best to use the stands that have the proven data about the short-term uh, DAP duration, but in reality, um, quite often other stands are used, and that's a matter of education there as well, also is availability. But also, it's important, I think, in a case like this, to minimize the stand length. Like in the case that Frankie showed, there was some disease in the proximal right. I've seen sometimes people who like to really get a perfect result, They'll put in you know, three or four stands, cover the whole right. And that's before knowing what would have happened in this patient with the colon cancer. So in these cases, I am I think it's the best strategy what he just did, send the culprit unless there is something really bad, and then let the patient heal. And that gives you the shorter, the shortest uh, length of stand and the least chance of having ischemic complications should DAPD needs to be discontinued in the future for various reasons. Yeah. And I think it's worth emphasizing that in the Onyx One study, over 50% of patients uh, uh, were uh, included with an acute Corey syndrome. Any points you want to make, David, on that? Just to expand on that, it, the STEMI instance uh, highlights all the uncertainties that we, that we have around the patient's bleeding risk, that we don't have the time for a very thorough uh, history and physical to be performed. We haven't seen these patients in the outpatient setting for a long period of time. And then uh, all of these uh, leading risk characteristics are revealed. And I, I would just add for myself, I still hold true to the, to the data. I think that each individual stent does need to be studied on its own merit. Um, for short dual antiplatelet therapy durations. Uh, that said, we do have favorable data with alternative stent designs, principally with three month durations. But even beyond that, um, most of those studies, or, or many of those studies at least, have excluded patients with acute coronary syndromes, um, or at least excluded patients with ST elevation myocardial infarction. But they were included in the um, in the Onyx Global uh, randomized clinical trial. Indeed, about 20%, as I recall, of patients did present with ST elevation myocardial infarction, and and one half of the patient present pre population presented with an ACS. 
let me ask um, let me ask you as far just to expand on on this topic further from one of our uh, our online um, question questions is that do you see if you put the crystal ball of, of interventional cardiology forward and i'll ask this to the rest of the group too is with the successes that we've observed with safety uh, of the current generation drug eluting stents and and drilling this duration down to one month do you ever see uh, an instance where we would just do a single antiplatelet agent with perhaps a more potent uh, p2y12 or adp antagonist uh, and and no dual antiplatelet therapy at all. Yeah, so so never bet against medical innovation, David. Um, you know we're down to four weeks. Stents are getting better; they're getting thinner struts. And whilst thin struts uh, strut stents may not be uh, uh, relevant for all lesion types, it may be that the type of case that we saw Frankie present, non-calcified small vessel, uh, small uh, lesion. Um, it may be that we have thinner and thinner strut stents whereby we can absolutely uh, put into practice what you've just illustrated, uh, even shorter duration with single antiplatelets. I do see that uh, uh, coming in the future. But I think there's another thing is that uh, sometimes the DAPT may not just put in a stent. Sometimes it's really just to prevent the O4 atherothrombotic uh, 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 event. In other, for example, if, if this patient has an other more lesion in the left main airway, these frequent flag, sometimes probably an, an, a, 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 a DAPT may be beneficial. For example, in the in the depth study, in other studies, the extended DAPT can uh, reduce the ischemic risk, but at the same time, increase the bleeding risk. So again, in other cases, it's the important to assess between the ischemic risk and bleeding risk. Of course, this patient has a high bleeding risk, but a very uh, minimal uh, ischemic risk. Uh, um, uh, uh, if you put a good stand, physical stand, short stand, then probably four weeks of single antibiotic would be okay. But in patients with extensive atherosclerosis, maybe a prolonged DPT is beneficial. And Frankie, at, in this particular case, after the patient undergoes a surgical resection uh, for the for the uh, gastrointestinal cancer, do you resume dual antiplatelet therapy, or do you keep the patient on a single antiplatelet agent? Yeah, so that's a very, very, very uh, 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 important question. So in this case, uh, after discussion, we decided to just keep the single uh, aspirin monotherapy because we think that uh, the stents, it's uh, well expanded and there's actually not much atherosclerosis in other part of the coronary tree. So in this case, we are confident that uh, we can remain on uh, uh, aspirin monotherapy. But on the other hand, if the same patient, if he has uh, more atherosclerosis in the left side, for example, the LAD or circumflex, probably we will resume back on DAPD and keep it for 12 months after all the bidding issues settled in her case. And uh, Manus, I'll ask you, in a patient who uh, possesses high bleeding risk, let's say, for example, with a prior gastrointestinal bleeding event, and you're transitioning to a single antiplatelet agent, do you, do you transition to aspirin or do you transition to clopidogrel? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, David. And actually, again, phenomenal case from Frankie. I, I do. Uh, I personally would uh, uh, most often uh, change to clopidogrel instead of aspirin in patients in whom we want to do the single. Like, for example, even on this patient who had the uh, cancer resected, then I can see you can continue with aspirin monotherapy. But another alternative is to give uh, clopidogrel monotherapy that still may have a favorable um, risk benefit ratio. But uh, as you know, the ACS. Um, patients might have kind of angry lesions or vulnerable lesions in multiple other places. And, you know, we've had studies now uh, showing that using other modalities like OCT for plaque rupture or looking imaging with near infrared spectroscopy might help. So I'm actually curious what people would do. Would anyone in patients like this do multivessel imaging, knowing that it's a high bleeding risk, if you do know that, and see if there's other kind of vulnerable lesions to use that as a basis of adjusting your anti therapy? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And I mean, I, I, I wouldn't image all three vessels, but I think it's worth emphasizing at this point that ideally, of course, in order to prevent further ischemic risk, you would want to keep uh, patients on uh, an anti ischemic, anti platelet agent for 12 months. And I think there are sufficient uh, phenotypic features that we can use to try and assess that risk rather than image all three vessels. 
as far I think um, Manas's response too with regard to the choice of a single anticoagulant agent in this patient's consistent with our audience. Just to share with the audience, 60% of our respondents elected for a transition to clopidogrel monotherapy and about 28, about 30% uh, selected aspirin monotherapy. Um, it's, it reminds us too of the um, reminiscent of the Capri trial that randomized patients to aspirin and clopidogrel showing uh, parity with regard to uh, efficacy, but actually lower GI bleeding complications with clopidogrel. And um, I would support the same as uh, Manos. Interestingly, we also saw a presentation from ACC this past week, the host exam study, um, perhaps suggesting greater efficacy with clopidogrel. I think those, uh, rather than aspirin as the trans, as the single antiplatelet agent, and I think we'll await more confirmatory data with regard to that, that uh, strategy as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it takes, it will take a lot of data and a lot of hard work to uh, remove aspirin from the minds of cardiologists and interventional yeah. cardiologists. And I think we're just beginning to scrape and look uh, at that evidence. You know, there was global leaders in addition to what you said, admittedly, with Ticagrelor and Twilight. But slowly but surely, that question is being asked and we're getting bits of data that suggest maybe it's a possibility. We've, um, we've come to our, our, our end of our time, and um, I have to say it's been an extremely engaging discussion, and, and, um, and, and the cases are, are more than engaging. I, just to summarize, we briefly reviewed the successful results of one-month dual antiplatelet therapy following PCI with the Resolute Stent in high bleeding risk patients from both the Onyx-1 global randomized trial and the Onyx CLEAR studies. Those uh, two trials led to the formal regulatory indications, both uh, in Europe and abroad, as well as in the United States for a one month DAP duration and high bleeding risk patients. Manus and Beatrice and Frankie, your cases remind us that complex PCI is ever more successful um, in the hands of expert clinicians like yourselves. And, uh, and I'll also thank, uh, again, Mirvat Alasnag, our chat master, for coordinating the, the comments from our audience. And many thanks to all of you who contributed questions, and especially to my friend and colleague, Asfar Zaman here, who is our lead discussant for these cases. So again, um, thank you all for being part of this program of balancing ischemic and bleeding risk, and uh, I very much welcomed your, your clinical insights.